Welcome to Civics. My name is Michael Shea. On Civics, we've been talking to community activists and volunteers who get involved in Arlington County and elsewhere uh, to make their community a better place to live. A lot of the times when you get involved with your community and you volunteer, you do it through a nonprofit. So today we're lucky to be joined by someone who's an expert on nonprofits, and we're going to learn a little bit more about what makes a good nonprofit and what are some successes in nonprofits. We're happy to be joined by Margot Bailey from Brighter Strategies. Margo, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. Now, it's fair to say that you've got a lot of experience with nonprofits, but what is do you think that drew you to wanting to work with nonprofits? What got you, what got you excited about that? I think what got me excited was the opportunity to help. You know, you can't be uh, a volunteer all the time. You can't serve on boards all the time. So I thought initially by teaching students about nonprofits who wanted to start nonprofits, it was a way to reach as many, a lot of people at one time. So, and I still feel that way. I think given the work that we do with nonprofits, you know, even though we're working within one organization, we're touching many people so that the knowledge base doesn't just stay with one person. So we're having greater impact as we, as we do our work. So you started in academics and you basically mm -hmm. transitioned. To, how, did, how did that come about, to transition into the consulting world? Um, the transition to the consulting world was academia wasn't quite the best fit for me in that, as most people know, academia requires, you know, the publish and perish. And so I had a lot more fun teaching and the community service than I did on the writing side of it. So it was a bit of a challenge for me. So when we came time to transition, I was like, I'm gonna work in a nonprofit because I had already done several uh, consulting projects with nonprofits. I was already serving on one, maybe two boards at that time. And so I thought it was an excellent opportunity to transition what I've been teaching what I know and now actually applying what I did. So when I moved into my, um, my first paid position as a nonprofit executive, it was, an oper it was a perfect match to take what I knew and apply it in, a, in an organization that was going through a lot of change. So it was a perfect match at the right time. And you were, what were, what were you uh, teaching? Oh, so I was in the yes. um, Department of Public Administration at American University, and I taught the capstone course on management analysis, which meant that it was the, one of the final classes that students took before they graduated, which allowed them to think through all of the core courses and say, so what does it all mean? And, you know, think through a variety of lenses to solve problems. I also taught, uh, designed and taught a course on uh, nonprofit management. So what are the nuts and bolts about putting together a nonprofit and then managing it? And then I also taught a course on strategic human resources management as well. So those were my three primary courses at the university. And um, so did you, did your academic, so you actually had, you had credentials, <laughs> you, know, you, had, you had that experience. Is that what you needed to, to do the nonprofit work? And were there other experiences mm -hmm. or other skills that you needed? Uh, I don't think that's, that's it's different, right? It's yeah. different for different people. I think for me, it was the right set of credentials okay. to move into consulting right. because I knew that um, I, I had the nuts and bolts. And actually what gave me the nuts and bolts was two things. One was serving on a board. Mm -hmm. I think serving on a board gave me that insider view about, okay, this is what people really need to know in order to make this work. And then I was at that time serving on a board that the organization was going through transition. So I, was, I served on two boards at that time. One was an organization going through transition and one was a startup nonprofit, um, a startup charter school. So it gave me those lenses to see about how do you start a nonprofit, how do you sustain it, and then how do you govern from the board side. And I think the other thing that helped was because I had done some consulting work as well. So my consulting work was around evaluation and program planning. So I was able to see what's important to a nonprofit, which is this programs. If you don't have strong programs, you don't have a strong nonprofit. And then also the governance side. So I had those two lenses that I was able to carry over into uh, one, my full-time work as a um, nonprofit executive, and then when I went full-time consultant. Right. Um, now, so what do you see, have there been changes since you've been involved, or mm -hmm. what do you see as the big changes for nonprofits mm -hmm. now? If they're going to be successful, are there, are, is there sort of new lessons they need to learn, mm -hmm. or things like that? I think, um, I do evaluation, that's one of my primary areas of consulting work, and I think what I've seen, well I know this is, this is a real, a true change, um, the focus on being able to measure your results. You mm -hmm. have to be able to demonstrate your impact. Um, it's not to say that the, the emphasis on storytelling has gone away. That's still important, but you have to balance storytelling now with real data. You have to be able to show you made an impact on the, 
on the students, the population that you say you're trying to serve. If you can't demonstrate that your program made a difference, you're not going to survive. I think the other thing that's changed as well is the uh, boards have to work differently now. Mm -hmm. It's really important for nonprofit boards to be engaged in the work. It used to be you could kind of like hang back as a nonprofit board, be happy that you had a great executive director. But I think um, because nonprofits have to be far more adaptable, mm -hmm. that the board and the board leadership has to be able to stay current in order to provide effective governance for the nonprofit. So I think demonstrating results and, and keeping a nonprofit board that's engaged and knowledgeable is are the trends that I think are most important now. Yeah. Right, because it, it used to be almost uh, the board, you, you wouldn't want them to be engaged. Mm -hmm. you, you might see them more as, well, they're the ones who make sure we're doing everything mm -hmm. by the book, we're, you know, we're fulfilling our duty. I mean, you saw them as more of an auditor. Mm -hmm. But you always, you know, at the same time, typically an organization has an auditor. So mm -hmm. you don't want the board to be the auditor. You do want them to be engaged like that. Mm -hmm. Have you, um, were you recruited? How were you, were you recruited to the board? Because that's an important issue for, mm -hmm. for any board is how are we going to recruit the people who are going to bring mm -hmm. that skill, that expertise, that energy mm -hmm. to make it work? Were yeah. you how did you get recruited? So now in my consulting work, I call that targeted recruiting, right? That you're very clear about the type of people that you need or want on your board. Um, because there, there are things that you need to get done. So I'm not sure if that's how I was identified, <laughs> but the first time uh, a student of mine, um, she was involved with the uh, startup charter school. Mm -hmm. she was, I was her professor at the time. She said, hey, Dr. Bailey, you want to be on our board? <laughs> Great, I'll do it. <laughs> and then, um, because I hadn't, you know, I, I was just starting on the other board. The other board was, um, they were looking for someone who had an interest in uh, an expertise around evaluation. So I had that expertise, was in the neighborhood where I live. Mm -hmm. um, I had some familiarity with the organization and I was like, cool. So I was serving on two boards <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> so, um, but you know, people just ask and I, at the time I was very interested um, and serving in that capacity, mm -hmm. and I and I, I had plenty of time to do that as well. So, I uh, do, I've done a lot of work with the Agency of International Development, and I ran to somebody once who I used to w had worked there, on the metro, and it was one of those. Hey, well, so what have you been mm -hmm. up to? And she just said, I've become a very bored lady. She was on something <laughs> like seven boards, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably too much, but she was very enthusiastic yeah. about yeah. it. So, so one, one thing I'll say about that is. Um, one of the things around um, targeted recruiting, I, um, I remind uh, board, people who want to serve on boards and boards that are recruiting new members, is that you really want to be careful about the number of boards that people serve on. Yes. Um, when we look at, um, you know, boards exist to provide some real responsibilities, and one of them is what they call duty of loyalty and duty of obedience. And duty of obedience and duty of loyalty speak to that information you hear in one part of your, right. you know, if you serve on two boards, what you hear on board A, you can't necessarily say to board B. So when right. you serve on a lot of boards, and particularly if the boards serve the same kind of problems, right. you can get into conflicts yeah. very, very quickly. Yeah. So we try to advise against seeking right. out board members who are already serving on lots of boards. Right, which is a little bit limiting because you want mm -hmm. experience, but you need to avoid the, mm -hmm. the conflicts. Mm -hmm. um, so, and do, do you think uh, social media technology, this mm -hmm. whole thing going on, has it really changed mm -hmm. the way a nonprofit can operate? Or what, what impact has it had, do you think? Okay. So I will say this, I am not a social media expert. That's fine. I am one of those individuals like, oh, it's way too much for me to figure it out. <laughs> I can barely handle my email. So what I, I think social media is great, yeah. but the most important thing is using social media to talk about your mission. Mm -hmm. If the social media is not linked to mission, then already we have evidence to show that social media does not always result in increased funding. People think mm -hmm. that if you have a great social media presence that it's going to immediately result in more fundraising activity, more m more money, but it's it's not that that line isn't straight right, all right. the time. And so social media is great depending upon what your work is right. and who you're trying to reach. So if the population that you're trying, if the donor population that you want to reach is heavily engaged in social media, then great, because they'll be tied into all the LinkedIn and Instagram and all those wonderful tools. 
But if you have a segment of donors that don't do that, but they're still important for you, you still have to serve those donors. Right. So social media is wonderful, but like any tool, you have to make sure you use that tool in the best way to suit your organization. Right, because at the one level, you think this just makes it so much easier to reach people. Mm -hmm. But it's, it, we're now working in a world where there's so many voices reaching people that if it's not tied to that mission, it's not going to stand mm -hmm. out from that, that din. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. every nonprofit, I will say at a basic level, every nonprofit has to have a, a basic um, website present mm -hmm. because now everyone says, oh, let me look at your website. Right. And so if you have a website, so you must have a website presence, so therefore your website must always look good. Right. It's not to say it has to be cluttered, but you know, it has to be able to show on the first page exactly who you are. People aren't going to peck out the information. So at a minimum, you will have a good website presence that right. you keep up on a regular basis. Right. Um, and no one likes to go to a website and then click on a button and see that the date, you know, the data there is two years old. So once you make the investment You've, you've in obviously been to one of my websites. <laughs> so. No, not to. <laughs> <laughs> so you really want to, you know, once you are, um, an organization decides to invest in social media, you have to think through how is it going to be maintained, how is it going to be updated, does it still remain relevant, so it's yeah. not, oh, we did it, and it's a checkoff box, and you don't visit it again for another five years. Right. And you, you talked about this to some extent, I think, but let's, getting back to real basics. If you if you want to start a nonprofit, what do you mm -hmm. what would you say are some of the things you would do absolutely first? Mm -hmm. I think I, I look nonprofits are businesses, yeah. right? We we tend to forget we, we we put the non on the profit, right? And we think oh we can just do anything. Nonprofits are a business, and every business has a set of competitors. Right. So there are lots of nonprofits that are doing work, particularly in this area. We have thousands yeah. of yeah. nonprofits. So one of the things that I think is important to do is when you're thinking about starting a nonprofit is to be clear that no one else is doing this work. Or if other organizations are doing this work, how are you different? Because right. this is a competition, right? You're competing for clients, you're competing for board members, you're competing for staff, you're competing for donors. So if you're coming into a space that other businesses already exist, why should they come to you? Mm -hmm. So you also, so I, I really think you have to do a market analysis mm -hmm. so that you're clear about what your space is, right. and then the next step, if, you, if you're really good at it, you're able to come up with a statement that we call a comparative advantage statement mm -hmm. or a competitive advantage statement, which says, we exist to do A, B, C, D. All the other organizations do you know, E, F, and G. Right. But because we do A, B, C, D, this is how we're unique to this space. So you really have to be clear about the market that you're in, who you're serving, who else is serving that community, and then that drives your mission. Right. And then once you're clear about your mission and your purpose, you can then focus on your program. So I think you have to do that kind of homework. And then the other basic is your board. Mm. You know, boards have just, you know, businesses have stages, boards have stages as well. So, you know, when you're first starting up, it's okay to have your closest friends. You know, you just want to get moving. But there comes a point where you have to feel you you have to reach beyond those who are protecting you to serve on your board right. to be able to get independent voices who believe in your program, who believe in your mission, but now they're going to be a bit more objective you know, and about the work that you're doing and provide that feedback that you need to grow. So, yeah, be clear about what it is that you want to do, mm -hmm. the space that you're working in, and be clear that your board is going to have to change over time as well. Right, and for, so for the research type thing, I guess the Foundation Center is a great mm -hmm. resource it's an for that. Excellent resource, uh, mm -hmm. and they offer classes and webinars mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And they also offer. I'll, I'll add to the classes; they're affordable. Right. Yeah, they're affordable. And some classes. of them, I think, every now and again, are maybe are even free. free. Mm -hmm. Alone, you know, so mm -hmm. that's good. Yeah. Uh, well, what? What are some successes that you mm -hmm. have, have worked on or know about? What, what, what excites you, maybe, is what, I want, mm -hmm. what, what I'm getting at in, in nonprofits lately. I, so, so for me, um, I still get excited about the results and yeah. the evaluation. So I love it when, in, in two ways. One, when I just come across a, 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 a nonprofit and let's say I go to their website and I'm immediately able to see, oh, wow. You can see their impact. They have a little data box there, and they you know, so that makes me excited. And I and when I work with organizations, helping them see the importance of being able to do that work, mm -hmm. 
And related to that is helping them understand that they already know how to do evaluation or measure their results. It's, it's not new, it's not foreign, and that is capable for them to do that. And more recently, I've been doing more work around board development and board mm -hmm. governance, which I really, really enjoy. I think um, the people and the organizations that we work with, they really want to be good board members. They really want to be good boards or mm -hmm. better boards. And so I, I, I really like doing that work, working with boards, helping them understand their roles and responsibilities and mm -hmm. how they can get better at the work that they're doing. Um, I really focus on board engagement. And so it's helping boards understand and board members understand how do you feel good about your service on a board? Mm -hmm. So that it doesn't become, oh, I'm going to this board meeting and they always talk for three hours and we never get anything done. So I like to work with boards and helping them to understand, you know, there are ways that you can keep people on point for your organization mm -hmm. when they show up, whether it's from the meeting itself, the board meetings themselves, the way their committees are structured, or how they do their outreach for new board members. I really like doing that as well. And do you, um, do you spend a lot of time with them to, to do this kind of consulting work? Mm -hmm. Do you, in a sense... How do you, I'm just curious, mm -hmm. do, you, do you get, do you feel like you get to know them? Oh, I would love to spend more time okay. with them, but it's they don't brief. always pay for it. Uh, well, that's true. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, it depends, right? So we have um, a few engagements where we work with the boards for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and we have other engagements where we might just talk, with, we might be invited for a board retreat. Right. And for an afternoon or for an entire day, we work with the boards to help them identify what their next steps will be. Mm -hmm. And then they figure out how they want to implement those steps. So we're able to spend some time with them to talk about roles and responsibilities, identify what's working well for their boards, what's not working so well, and then say, so what's most important for you to do, to do next? And hopefully mm -hmm. leaving them with enough um, enough information and enough direction when they can say, okay, we feel comfortable doing this work. And then if they would like for us to come back for more than, you know, we, we, of course we want to come back and help them to, get, to do that work. Right. So now a big part of the nonprofit scene is uh, a nonprofit public uh, private partnership. I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a um, collaboration that I think it's fair to say is becoming increasingly mm -hmm. common in mm -hmm. local government and state government. Um, what have you got? What's your thought on that? In mm -hmm. terms of, is that sort of shifted? Is that, are there things that y you need to know that's unique to that? Mm -hmm. Do you think? Yeah, I think um, it's become more important, as you said, because yeah. it's being required. Right. Funders, you know, private foundations are requiring them. State, local, and federal um, funders are requesting them as well. So before, where you could say, oh, I don't want to work with anybody. I'm just going to submit this grant by myself. Now one of the grant requirements may be that you have to partner or collaborate with another organization in order to be eligible for the funding. And so the lessons that I've learned about partnership and collaboration is that it goes, it, you know, we, I mentioned earlier the importance of being able to identif identify what's unique about you mm -hmm. because when you partner with other organizations, everyone has to be clear about what it is that they contribute to the partnership. If it's not clear what their contribution is, then already it's not clear how, if they get the funding, how they're going to implement their program. And so oftentimes we cobble together partnerships or we think these partnerships are going to work because we're good colleagues. Right. But there may be something in our systems in the way that we even think about how we get our work done that when now you get the funding and you try to make it work, there are some core values or some core things that now show themselves as, oh, this really isn't a good partnership. So I think when you approach, um, remember, this is a business, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at linking your success to another organization, be very clear about the strengths, your own strengths and weaknesses and the strengths and weaknesses of the other partner or the potential partner, so that when you come together, you're clear about this is how we're going to run this program. You don't want to decide that afterwards. You want to be clear about that as you go into yeah. you know, the particular project that you wish to fund. So you, so you need to do partnerships. I don't think anyone's going to be effective without partnerships, but be very mindful about how you're tagging your success to someone else as you, as you formalize those relationships. And get the lawyers involved, I guess. And get, well, if you need some, uh, you know, <laughs> we joke about the lawyers, but sometimes you do need to think through. Um, in that, partnerships can be established through memorandums of understandings, right. MOUs, but then sometimes you might need that formal legal contract as well 
So yeah, you, right. you know, sometimes the lawyers have to be there. <laughs> but let's let's just um, talk about failure for a minute because mm -hmm. obviously you don't set up a nonprofit with the idea you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. You never try to fail. But you know, in in business, in art, I mean, in so many things, it's that ability. You, you have to almost be willing to fail. You have to take some risks. You have to. Um, you have to be able to learn from failure. You have to. I mean, you need a space where we're, we're going to get a better nonprofit, a better world, when people can can fail sometimes. Mm -hmm. Is is it sort of one of the things where you you have to think about it as yeah, push the envelope or what? Mm -hmm. Do you have a, a sense of what's the the best approach for that? Yeah. So what's the proper balance between risk taking, right. um, innovation, right? and security, right? What, what's yes. the balance, right? You, you can just keep on doing what you're doing, or do you want to try something different because you think you might be able to get um, better results? And some of it is how much, how much reserve do you have, <laughs> right? What kind of dollars do you have available to carry you through if, 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 you, if, it's, a, if it's a risk? And I think it depends. I think one of the things that we say all the time is if you're not changing, you're falling behind, right? right? If you stay the same, you're actually falling behind. So an organization that is thinking about its future is always thinking about, you know, there are some things, you know, the people we serve are changing, the, you know, things are changing, so therefore we have to look at it. So if we look at innovation in terms of, do we want to do something brand new that's never been done mm -hmm. before? Well, that's a different way of thinking about risk taking, right? Yeah. Now you're going through building a new program. But if you're looking at innovation and risk taking in terms of our population is changing, how are we going to adapt? Right. Now you might be thinking about risk taking in a different way. So it depends, but it's something that you have to be willing to do. And I think it's an area where, particularly for nonprofits, where, um, you know, nonprofits, government, I think as well, where you have, you have a public service mentality to mm -hmm. protect. Right? You want to preserve, you want to protect. And so you tend to be a bit more conservative, but you can't always be conservative because you have to, you have to push the envelope to get better results. And, and that's not always a comfortable space for organizations to be in. Right. And, and, I'll, and I'll add, when you make change, it impacts people, it impacts jobs, right. it impacts families. So that becomes a constraint in the public sector as well. You know, we, we, we can say in the corporate sector, they really don't care about that. They do what they have to do. But in the nonprofit sector, people are very, when, when they make those or they think those decisions have to be made, it's a very deliberative process mm -hmm. because they understand the impact that it will have right. on people who've been with them for a very long time. And a lot of times in the nonprofit sector, it's, it gets to a lot of uh, values, things that people, mm -hmm. you get engaged in nonprofit because of something you consider very important. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you're affecting not maybe someone's career, but also someone's um, ability to live out their value. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot at stake. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the program. I want to thank our volunteer crew at Arlington Independent Media. They've been great. Uh, and most of all, I want to thank Margot Bailey for thank everything you. she does to make nonprofits even better. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much.